All right, in this video, we're going to talk about the skin. The skin is also known as the integumentary system. And the integumentary system is the largest body covering, the largest in terms of surface area, largest organ in the body. It's our protective covering, and it includes the skin, the hair, the nails, and some of those glands, such as the oil glands and the sweat glands. When you think about the functions of the skin, its function is to protect our tissues from trauma, from bacteria and infection, and water loss. So when we think about burns or injuries to the skin, we are at risk of damage to those tissues, um, water and electrolyte loss, and infection. Infection is the, is the primary um, concern when anybody has a break in the skin. Um, the skin also helps regulate our body temperature. Those sensory receptors are part of that negative feedback system we talked about in the previous video, and that helps to determine if there's a need by the body to respond to changes in temperature, whether it be sweating or shivering to uh, change body temperature. So it contains sensory receptors to protect us from injury. You'll find that you shift around in your chair because you feel a little discomfort on your bottom as you sit too long, or maybe when you're laying in bed on your side, you roll over because of those sensory receptors keeping your skin safe by telling you it's time to move and take the pressure off of those parts. And when we look at people that have um, Alzheimer's, dementia, are taking a large amount of pain medications, those sensory receptors um, aren't providing the information correctly, and as a result, those people are at risk for bed sores and pressure ulcers. Um, we also have temperature receptors. If it's getting too hot or too cold, we make some minor changes, like putting on a sweater or taking off a sweater because of the sensations we get from those temperature receptors. So it just makes us aware of our surroundings and let us, lets us modify or, or respond in a way that maintains homeostasis. So when we look at what makes up the integumentary system, we have different types of tissues. We have stratified squamous tissue. We have um, smooth muscle tissue and adipose tissue, lots of different tissues within the skin, and we'll talk about that. So the two major regions of the skin are the epidermis and the dermis. So when you look at this model here, this diagram, the epidermis is this upper portion that ends with this wavy bottom layer. So this is the epidermis, and it's made up primarily of stratified squamous epithelium, so many layers of flattened dead cells. And then when we get below that, this is the dermis. This is the structural layer of our skin. And this is made up of areolar tissue, which is kind of, um, I'm sorry, not areolar tissue, loose connective tissue. Loose connective tissue is what we find here in the dermis. And then below that is the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer, layer or sub-Q. If you've heard of injections that are sub-Q injections, it means those, those medicines like insulin or heparin, blood thinners, they go into this fatty layer, into the sub-Q layer. So this is not part of the skin. It is our insulating layer, our cushioning layer. It's the hypodermis, and we see mostly adipose cells here. So this yellow here is the fat we see in the hypodermis. So the skin itself is made up of the epidermis, many layers of flattened cells, stratified squamous, and then the loose connective tissue of the dermis. The dermis is our structural layer, provides strength, and prevents tears. And if you get a major injury to your skin, this is where the stitches will go because we can't stitch stratified squamous tissue. It just tears apart and falls off. But this loose connective tissue that we find here in the um, loose, I'm sorry, dense irregular connective tissue, dense irregular is where we can put those stitches and provide that strength and, and repair. So lots of different structures in the dermis we can see. We have a hair follicle with an oil gland here. We have some sensory receptors that are shown in yellow. We have the blood vessels of the dermis. Notice there's no blood vessels in the epidermis. It's a pretty much dead layer, um, protective layer. We, all the blood flow and oxygen and nutrients have to diffuse from the dermis into the epidermis to feed these cells. So we have an erector pili muscle here that helps pull the hair upright when it contracts when we're cold. So this hair follicle is a tat, has a oil gland attached to it for secreting oil to moisten the skin, and also this erector pili muscle to pull that hair follicle upright and the hair to stand upright. 
We also have um, sweat glands. That's what these little purple coiled structures are. These secrete sweat right to the surface. So these connect right to the surface to allow sweat to go over the surface of the skin. So that's where this is coming from. It's just coming from an, a sweat gland. This coiled structure has a small tube going right to the surface for sweat to be secreted. All right, so then the epidermis is that thin outermost layer made up of stratified squamous epithelium. And if we have damage to the skin, like large amounts of damage, we can replace the, the skin through grafting. And sometimes, like with severe burns, they'll take skin from other parts of the body, like usually the upper thigh or the buttocks. Um, they'll remove the skin there and put it where the burned area is if it's, you know, in an area of thin skin, like, for example, on the face. So the cells that we find in the skin are called keratinocytes. They're filled with a waxy waterproofing protein called keratin, and that's what prevents water loss and keeps a nice barrier. So when you go swimming or take a bath, a long bath, you don't fill up with water because of the keratin in your skin keeps that water out and prevents water loss as well. We also have immune cells in our skin to fight infection called Langerhans cells. And we have melanocytes that produce the brown pigment melanin. And everybody has this key concept here. Everybody has the same number of melanocytes, but it's the amount of melanin they produce that determines how dark a person's skin is. So a person that is albino has no melanin production, and a person with very, very dark skin skin has a large amount of melanin production. So it's not the number of melanocytes, it's the amount of melanin those melanocytes produce that determines skin tone. When we look at other things related to skin color, carotene is kind of an orangish pigment and hemoglobin um, gives skin its normal pink color. If we are low in oxygen and low hemoglobin, delivery to the skin, that's going to cause a bluish tint to the skin. We call that cyanosis. Cyan is the color for blue, and cyanosis is when the lips and the skin turn blue with low oxygen. We also have important vitamin D production that occurs in the cells of the epidermis when it's exposed to UV rays or sunlight. And vitamin D is really important for absorbing calcium from our diet and keeping our bones strong. And it's also important for the immune system to function. If you have good vitamin D production, your immune system is functioning well. We've also found that vitamin D um, deficiencies have also um, been linked to depression. So um, almost every cell in the body has receptors for vitamin D, so we're still discovering what its uses are. And a lot of us are vitamin D deficient. So if you have trouble with depression and low immune function, it's not a bad idea to supplement with some vitamin D. They usually say about 2,000 MIU of vitamin D is a good starting point for people. It used to be much lower than that, but after some research, they found that many of us are vitamin D deficient. So it's always a good idea, though, to ask your doctor, maybe get a vitamin D level checked and see if you could benefit from vitamin D supplementation. Skin cancers are um, when we have cells of the skin that grow out of control. So they have some type of genetic change, some DNA change. Maybe it's caused by something genetic runs in the family or chronic exposure to um, the sun and chronic damage to the skin. So if you have lots and lots of sunburns, lots and lots of sun exposure over a lifetime, like people that are roofers, construction workers, um, lifeguards, people that just like to sun a lot, they like to go to the tanning bed, they like to look really dark, um, that causes damage to the skin over time and can um, increase the risk for skin cancer. So basal cell uh, carcinoma is a cancer of those cells on the bottom of the epidermis. <clears throat> and there's also squamous cell carcinoma. That's another type of skin cancer. Those together are the most common, and they cause um, just a little sore on the skin that doesn't quite heal. And it's easily cured if it can be diagnosed and removed. So that's a good thing. So farmers, construction workers, lifeguards, people that really enjoy the sun, they really have to pay attention to their skin. But the other type of can skin cancer, melanoma, is very deadly. It can strike at any age. It's more common in people with red hair and freckles. And it is most often from a new mole that forms. It becomes cancerous, or it could be from an existing mole. But most commonly, it's a new mole that forms and becomes cancerous, and it spreads to the body. 
and causes death very quickly. Um, I've known several patients I've had in the hospital. They were all younger people under the age of 50 and as young as in the 30s that had melanoma and it was stage four by the time they were diagnosed. So very, very deadly cancer. So if you or anyone you know is red haired or freckled, they need to take extra precautions with skin exposure and watch their moles. And if you have a partner or a spouse that can look at moles on the back side of the body, that's a very good idea because these um, moles can sneak up on people and become cancerous and they don't even realize it. So here's an example of what a basal cell carcinoma looks like. This would be just that most common type of skin cancer. It's just a sore that doesn't heal. And melanoma has a very distinct look, kind of raised here we can see. It has a very dark color, irregular borders, and it grows in size. So anytime you have an abnormal mole or a sore that just doesn't want to go away, it's always a good idea to get it checked. Melanoma in women often occurs on the lower legs. Same thing with skin cancer. Women tend to not use sunscreen on their lower legs. And in men, it ends up on the torso because they end up not putting a lot of sunscreen on their chest and back. And they take their shirt off on a hot summer day and that increases the risk of skin cancer. So that second layer of the skin, the dermis, is your thicker, protective layer of the skin. It has lots of fibers for structural strength. So when we're getting tattoos, that's where the tattoo ink is injected. When we're getting stitches, that's where the stitches go. Lots of blood vessels, sensory receptors, glands. A lot of the activity in the skin occurs in the dermis. That's where we also find those sensory receptors for light and coarse touch, pressure, pain, hot and cold. All those receptors occur in the dermis. Remember, the epidermis is just a layer of flattened, stratified squamous cells that are more for protection than anything else. Remember, the subcutaneous layer is not part of the skin. It's that layer below the dermis. It's mostly adipose tissue and some loose connective tissue. That's where we store energy in the skin. So when we gain weight, our subcutaneous layer is the layer that's increasing in size. And it has ultimate ability to increase in size. So those fat cells grow larger and larger and larger. Anytime we bring calories in and we don't burn those calories, it gets stored. And people can grow larger and larger until they get 800 pounds or more. I mean, you've seen, you know, shows about that. And, you know, eventually the body dies. Most people that have extreme obesity die of respiratory failure and heart failure or one or the other or both because the lungs and the heart just can't keep up with supplying oxygen to such a large body mass. So again, we have storage of energy, insulating the body and protection from injury as you get bumped because of the hypodermis and that fatty layer. So when you have very, very thin individuals, they're more likely to get bumps and bruises because they just don't have that fatty protective layer. Accessory organs of the skin are those things that we find on the digits. So our nails, the cuticle, the little half moon shape at the base of your cuticle, the, the lunula. These are are structures that are just accessories. Um, the nails offer a protective covering on the ends of our fingers so we don't damage our fingers when we're picking up things. Just provides a little bit of protection. <clears throat> the hair can help warm the body. It can also serve as a sensory receptor when something crawls over the sur surface of your skin like a tick or a mosquito, you can feel that little change in the hair follicle and that stimulates a sensory receptor and then you know that something's crawling on you. Erector pili muscles pull on the hair follicle, like I said, when they contract and they create goosebumps, which can happen when we're emotionally triggered, right? If someone tells you a sad story or you get scared, it also can work for temperature control. You know, when you get a little chill, you kind of have those that sensation of your hair standing up. The oil glands, we said, were associated with the skin with that hair follicle. It produces what we call sebum. It's another name for a fatty substance, which is oil. And that helps protect bacterial growth. But when we combine the oils of the skin with bacteria from the environment, that causes body odor. And when we have blocked oil glands, you know, due to hormone changes and poor hygiene, that can relate to acne. But again, most um, of acne is related to hormone changes during puberty and early adulthood, so it has nothing to do um, with hygiene levels. But later in life, if people get acne, sometimes that can be related to, you know, working outside a lot and just not keeping the surface of the skin clean. 
The sweat glands, we said, come from the dermis. They open up through specialized ducts, their own duct going right to the skin surface, and that helps to regulate body temperature as well because as that sweat um, dries and goes into a gas form, it takes heat with it. So when you blow a fan on your skin, when you're, head, when you're sweating, you feel so much better because the heat in that liquid sweat is released into the air as it as it becomes a gas. So sweat glands are really good at you know cooling the body. But we also have sweat glands in our armpits and in our hands. And when you're nervous, you might feel that sweat you know quickly be released in your hands and your armpits. And that is not for temperature control. So those are just more of a nervous activity that uh, we see with that. So that concludes our discussion on the integumentary system.